It was much more common for free persons of color to own slaves in Latin America and the Caribbean than in the U.S. The only place this wasn't true was New Orleans, a former Latin American colony. One-third of the free colored families in New Orleans owned slaves, and 3,000 free persons of color joined the Confederate Army during the Civil War. In 1784, Thomas Jefferson proposed a law declaring slavery illegal in all western territories of the country as it existed at that time, nearly 80 years before the American Civil War. This would have kept slavery out of Alabama and Mississippi. The bill lost by one vote, that of a legislator too sick to come in that day. The phrase, separation of church and state, is a misquote of a line written by Thomas Jefferson in a letter to the Baptist Association of Danbury, Connecticut, on January 1, 1802. Many Americans assume the phrase is written in the Constitution itself, and that any reference to religion by any politician is a violation of this supposed law. In reality, it is only written in this letter to Danbury, and refers to the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, which says that the government cannot favor one religious institution over another. This was radically different from the past god-kings of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and still holds true today, as there is no formal joining between the state and any church. While those facts about colonial life in America might be mind-blowing to you, they're not the ones I'm most shocked by. The most important thing you need to know about life in colonial America is something that we've largely forgotten nowadays and is something that was assumed to be true by pretty much everyone back then, and it's called the Golden Triangle of Freedom. This triangle isn't some occult symbol or Freemason secret sign, it's a diagram of three crucial American values that no one talks about nowadays and that no one learns in school, the first of which is virtue. In 1787, the Founding Fathers realized the country's federal government, through the Articles of Confederation, was too weak to hold each of the states together in one nation, so they met to create a stronger, but not too strong, governmental system. In the summer before the creation of the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to some friends of his in France, where he quite plainly states that only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. This sounds impossible to us now, even more considering that Benjamin Franklin wasn't even really a strict moralist or an orthodox Christian for that matter. He's not saying freedom and virtue are related, but instead that freedom is impossible without virtue, and he says it so matter-of-factly. Virtue is defined as moral excellence and righteousness, and Franklin wasn't alone in his thinking. John Adams, in a letter in 1776, The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. James Madison in the Federalist Papers were the pictures that have been drawn by the political jealousy of some among us faithful likenesses of the human character, the inference would be that there is not sufficient virtue among men for self-government. Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America America is great because it is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. It seemed clear to them that freedom simply required people to act virtuously, and that might be true even today, but virtue has a requirement too. The prerequisite to virtue, goodness, is faith, and this concept is almost completely foreign to modern culture. Faith is the assent of the mind to the truth of a proposition or statement for which there is not complete evidence. And no one claims to know the complete evidence behind the supernatural, and so faith is required. This too was assumed by the colonial greats. John Adams, in a letter to his officers, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Alexis de Tocqueville In France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom marching in opposite directions. But in America, I found they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. George Washington, in his farewell address, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. And yet the diagram is a triangle, which means that faith also has a requirement, and that's freedom. Modern America has almost completely returned to the 18th century French Enlightenment ideals of the men who were, frankly, appalled by the religious wars of the previous century. Again, Alexis de Tocqueville saw right through to the truth. There are certain populations of Europe whose unbelief is only equaled by their ignorance and debasement, while in America, one of the freest and most enlightened nations in the world, the people fulfill with fervor all the outward duties of religion. He also commented that America was unique with regard to the different sects of religion within herself. All the sects of the United States are comprised within the great unity of Christianity, and Christian morality is everywhere the same. 
And even before America was founded, this assumption was found in the charter of the colony of Rhode Island. No person within said colony, at any time hereafter, shall be in any wise molested, punished, disquieted, or called into question for any difference in opinion in matters of religion. Freedom is the condition of being free of restraints, especially the ability to act without control or interference by another or by circumstance. And this is necessary for faith, because any kind of faith that is forced really isn't faith at all. The life-changing part of this is that the Golden Triangle of Freedom, something that we've forgotten nowadays, was an assumption by the Founding Fathers, something they never even had to argue about. This was a big deal for me to learn, and I know it'll be the same for you, because it's completely the opposite of all of modern-day thinking. To get the context on what modern-day thinking really is, you need to see this video over here. I'll see you next time.